Well, you can turn to Romans chapter 1. We started this series back in March. And uh, we took a little break. And here we are again. So we're going to relaunch Romans chapter 1. I'm excited for the opportunity to, uh, to go through this extremely rich, theologically rich letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers who were in Rome. What a, what a blessing this book is. I, now I've got a, a, a commentary in my office that no lie is probably close to three inches thick. <laughs> and it's just on Romans, okay? So, I mean, you know, you, you know, we could spend the rest of our lives, if you'd like, you know, studying the book of Romans. We're not going to. But it is so rich. It is so deep. There are portions of Romans that, uh, for some, are very controversial just because of the theology that's presented. And uh, it's, it's, to be honest with you, quite offensive. If you just read it, uh, what the text says, uh, we, we, and we don't put ourselves over the text and, and make ourselves the judge of the text and impose our preconceived notions onto the text, and we just let the Holy Spirit uh, proclaim what is there, and it rises up out of the text. When we do that, we find our pride smashed to the ground and the sovereign glory of God exalted. That's also in Romans. And so it's, a, it's an exciting journey. There's a lot of practical application, especially as you begin in chapter 12. And in reality, chapters 1 through 11 are just packed with theology and Paul's making a case related to the gospel and how we all need it, both Jew and Gentile. But when you get to chapters 12 on, it's all applying the gospel, the implications of the gospel what does that look like for our lives as, as believers in Christ? As those who are recipients of this glorious gospel I've been talking about in the first 11 chapters. And chapter 12 on is the application of that. So it's going to be a really wonderful journey together and I'm excited about it. At the outset of this journey together, let us commit to just let the text speak for itself. And not rise above the text to make ourselves the judge and jury of what God did or did not say. Let's try to find out what God says. And then respond humbly to Him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You so much for Your Holy Word. It is absolutely perfect and glorious. We are grateful that You have given us the blessing of opening Your Word together, reading it, and the Spirit of God enlightening us opening up our minds and understanding so that we can comprehend what you have there for us. We know it is a work of the Spirit because by ourselves we're just dunces. We need the Spirit of God to teach us. And so we pray that you would do that today. And Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus, would you please grant them saving faith that they may know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, for those who aren't here today, you look around, you see a friend or somebody that's t typically here, and maybe they're looking for the online version of this message. It's not posted today. I did not pre-record it, so I sure hope that's getting recorded today. Okay, awesome, because we're going to get that posted uh, later on, so we're trying to see if that'll work, uh, where they get just one version, the live version, with us together. But Romans chapter 1, we're going to talk about a tale of three identities. A tale of three identities, and it says this, Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
a tale of three identities. Many people today are trying to find themselves. I grew up hearing that terminology and always wondered, what do you mean you're trying to find yourself? I mean, you're right there. But, you know, I guess it's some deeper psychological self-awareness type journey that sometimes people go on. And sometimes that includes looking into their own family tree and their family history. Try to figure out who they really are, their identity. My wife's middle name is Jewel. And she is a Jewel. Everybody say Jewel. Jewel. She's shaking her head going, really. <laughs> you know, she was named after a relative. Or so she thought, up until recently, for all of her life, she'd, she'd been told at a young age and everything else that she was, you know, named after a relative. And so she had that connection, that identity with her family history. And recently, though, she was in a conversation with her mom and mother and something came up about her middle name and they, they finished the conversation. It wasn't too long and her mom called back and said, yeah, there's something I need to share with you. Huh. <laughs> Where did you get that middle name? And Allie mentions it, and her mother says, "Yeah, uh, about that. Actually, I had a real, I had a best friend growing up, all the way through elementary school and high school, and and her middle name was Jewel, and I named you after her. <laughs> and my wife doesn't even know this lady. I mean, she's got an identity crisis now. So much for the connection to family. So she responds to her mom after some conversation. Hey, mom, is there anything else you need to share with me? You know." <laughs> I mean, I'm 29 years old. I'd kind of like to know, you know. What? You're not 29? Okay. You know, what other secrets do you want to share? So pray for her. She's got an identity crisis now. And so today we're looking at three identities in the introduction to Romans. We just read the introduction to Romans. And in doing this, we want to learn our own true identity. So first of all, if you're taking notes, let's look at the identity of Paul. The identity of Paul. You look down there at verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Look down in verse number 5, through whom, talking about Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Paul identi identified there in verse 1, fill in the blank, Paul identified as a slave. Slave, the word there, servant, probably translated in your text, doulos is slave. It's a slave. Many, many people identified as slaves in the first century in the Roman church, as one writer uh, shares, uh, was made up probably of uh, as many as 60% who had a slave origin. At some, they may have been become free, they may have purchased their freedom, uh, but uh, there are some that still were slaves. And so about 60%, some estimate, uh, of the people who were involved in the church at Rome had a background or present, hist uh, present uh, reality of slavery. And so Paul is writing to them and he starts off in the first uh, few words in our English text, Paul, now I'm going to introduce myself to you, I know you've heard of me, but let me introduce myself to you, Paul, a slave. Yeah, okay, so he's already got a connection with them, but a slave of Christ Jesus. So the slave life was a very familiar concept of identity to those early believers. But Paul said, I'm not I'm a slave to anybody here or anybody there. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Now most slaves in the first century Rome served in households. As a matter of fact, if a slave uh, served in a wealthy home or somebody that had high so social importance, then that also lent to them some social uh, importance as well for the slave. But Paul says, I am a slave of the Lord of glory. I am a slave of Christ Jesus. And so you're talking about a connection with a higher up, right? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a, sla a slave of Christ himself. Now, I know we got a lot of history with this idea of slavery in our own country. And it's horrific when you read about it and when you go into history and look at it. But when you're a slave of Christ, all that baggage is not there. You and I are slaves of Christ. If you're in Christ, if you know Jesus, you are a slave of Christ. And so you can hold your head up high because you're in the Master's household, the Lord of glory. So you hold your head up high. You're second to none. 
You're not a second class citizen at all. You hold your head up high as you serve Jesus, even, listen carefully, as you hold your heart down low in humility before others because the master of the house would take off his outer garment and wash the feet of the disciples who would soon betray him. And so you head up, your head is high. You don't have to walk around in shame and in fear. You're a slave of the master who is the Lord of glory and yet you have a humble heart before Christ and before others. Write this down. Paul identified not just as a slave. Paul identified as an apostle. And he mentions that there in verse 1. Called to be an apostle. He was a representative for Christ. At the foundation of the church. In the early church. He's one who received authority for special ministry. During the foundational days of the church. He had seen the Lord Jesus, which is one of the requirements of apostleship. But he had become an apostle as one born out of due time, he later would say. He wasn't one of the original inside group. The Lord saved him dramatically on the road, right? When he was headed to persecute believers. So he was an apostle. But he also, write this in your notes, Paul identified as a set-apart man. He identified as a set-apart man. There in verse 1, look at the last part, he says, set apart for the gospel of God. That word is aphorizo in the Greek. It's the same word that's used to describe the commissioning of Paul for gospel ministry in Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. And so it says this, while the, the church is gathered, and it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, presumably through some of the early church prophets there, the Holy Spirit said, listen, set apart. Same exact word that Paul uses here in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, when he says set apart for the gospel of God. He's hearkening back to his commissioning service back in Acts chapter 13 where it says, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, which would later be Paul, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. In recent months, we, we ordained, we set apart for gospel ministry, Pastor Ryan, who's back in the fellowship center, by the way, for the overflow. And uh, we also ordained Brother Richard to deacon ministry. And so we see this idea here in the scripture. And Paul said, I identify, I'm identifying as a set apart man for the gospel of God. And I remember the day that the Holy Spirit told the church to set me apart for that. And they fasted and prayed and laid their hands upon me and sent me out. I, I identify as that set apart man for the gospel of Jesus. There were a lot of people living in the first century. But Paul said, I'm set apart from them all. I'm set apart by God himself for a specific task to serve the Lord by advancing the message of the gospel. You might feel like an insignificant person. You might feel like you're not that important. But listen, to the one person that God wants you to reach, I want you to think of that one person in your life that you've been concerned about, that you wonder, or maybe you know, and that you wonder if they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. To that person, you are the most important person in their life, whether they know it or not, because you're the ambassador of Christ to them. And so it's your job, your duty, to prayerfully seek God and ask Him, Lord, give me the opportunity to speak, verbally speak, the witness of the gospel to this person and urge them to believe. God has a specific task. You're set apart for His glory. Are you doing that? Are you glorifying God as a set apart follower of Christ? Write this down. Paul identified as a man with a mission. As a man with a mission, look down at verse number 5. He says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Notice that his mission was to bring about the obedience of faith. And James would say, you say you have faith, uh, and, and the other person says he has works. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you show me and I'm paraphrasing, the genuineness of your faith by the works that you do. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you, or Master, Master, Boss, Boss, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do 
what I tell you to do. And so there's this obedience of faith. The Old Testament Israel. God set out the law for them. He gave them the path to follow. He gave them the blessing if they would follow and obey. The curse if they didn't. And they went off on the path of didn't. They, they disobeyed God. And so instead of having faith in the Lord and walking in the commands of God, they were unfaithful. They did not have the obedience of faith. And so Paul is saying, I was set apart by God for a gospel mission. I'm a man with a mission to bring about the obedience of faith. People who hear about the gospel of Jesus, they receive Christ as, and confess him as Lord, and then they walk in obedience to the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not good enough to just say, hey, I believe, I'm a Christian. And your life looks like Hades on earth. It's hell for the rest of you Baptists. Okay? You, you, your, your life, we're all sinners. We all, we all sin. Okay? That's why the Bible says 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sin. He's, a, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we sin, even as believers. But what does your life look like? Are you okay with sinning? Are you okay with walking away from the, obedi uh, from the obedience of faith? What Christ has commanded, what His Word says, your life should reflect the reality that you both believe and that you obey. Paul had a mission to bring about the obedience of faith, but he also said, for the sake of His, Christ's name, among all the nations. So Paul could have said, hey, you know what? I'm a Jew, and I'm staying right here in Jerusalem. And I'm going to build up the Jerusalem church. I'm an apostle born out of due time. God's given me this calling to proclaim the gospel. I'm going to try to reach as many Jews as I possibly can right here in the homeland, right here in our capital city, right here in Jerusalem. That's where I'm going to do, but that's not what God called him to do. He said, for the sake of his name, to make Christ's name magnified, famous throughout the nations. He said, the obedience of faith for, his, for the sake of his name among all the nations, he had a missionary calling. He had a mission God had called him to follow. He was the prototype of what we call a missionary today. Somebody who brings the gospel to Jesus, of Jesus to the nations. Let me ask you, are you living with the mission of God at the core of your identity? Or is there this like God check mark thing on somewhere in your life? At the center and the core of who Paul was, it was the mission. It was the call. We've got to get close to his perspective on that. So today we're looking at three identities in the introduction of Romans. We're learning about our own true identity as we do this. We've looked at the identity of Paul, but let's also look at the identity of Jesus. Write that in your notes. The identity of Jesus. And first of all, Jesus is identified as the Messiah. You say, where's the word Messiah? Well, it's not in the text. But look back at verse 1, verse 4, verse 6, verse 7, and look at one word in those verses. Christ, 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 Christ. The word Christ. It's the same thing as the word Messiah. Let me give you a little bit of explanation. The church at Rome was made up largely, and I quote, of a Gentile majority and a Jewish minority, end quote. Remember Pentecost? Remember after Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again and then he stayed around for a while and then he ascended, right? And then some weeks later we have Pentecost. The one described in Acts chapter 2. Go back and read it. Not now. But we're told in Acts chapter 2 verse 5 and Acts 2 verse 10. Really, listen to this. It's fascinating. There were dwelling in Jerusalem... So who was present at that Pentecost when the church was formed in Acts 2? There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. Well, of course, it's Jerusalem. Wait. Devout men from every nation under heaven. And visit, and it goes on a whole list of ethnic groups. And then he says, and he adds this, and visitors from Rome. Let that sink in. And visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes. Proselytes to Judaism. Paul didn't plant the church at Rome. And no doubt there were people there. It says right here in the text, Acts chapter 2, 
that there were people present at Pentecost when the church was formed, when the Spirit went out, when 5,000 were saved, people were baptized, who then went back, left Pentecost, left, left the celebration of Pentecost, went back to Rome. And now they confess Jesus is Lord. And a church is birthed from these Jew, predominantly Jewish people who had gone to Jerusalem for Pentecost, but also proselytes to Judaism who are now followers of Christ. And they had started, they had returned home to Rome, started gathering in worship of Christ Jesus. Now listen, a little bit more background. The predominant language of the people in the church at Rome, both Jew and Gentile, was Greek. What we call Koine Greek. First century common language of the day. Throughout the Roman Empire, Greek. And so it didn't matter what your ethnic background was there in Rome. This church predominantly made up of people who were speaking Greek. Paul writes to them not in Hebrew, not in Aramaic, which was a common uh, language as well. But he's, he writes to them in Greek. And when he writes in verse number 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christos, which means anointed one, which is the same as the Old Testament Messiah. So instead of using the Hebrew word Messiah, Paul, writing to the church at Rome, made up of Jew and Gentile, who all speak Greek, uses the Greek equivalent, Christ. I'm a servant of Christ. And he mentions Christ four times. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. Anointed one. Anointed one. Anointed one. The anointed one, Jesus. The anointed one, Jesus. The anointed one, Jesus. The anointed one, Jesus. I promise you they got it. He was the one who was to come. Promised from centuries past. The one on whom the whole world would hang their hopes and they would hang him too. Right? One writer puts it this way, Christ, or anointed, is the official title of our Lord occurring, listen to this, 514 times in the New Testament. <laughs> you think Jesus is Messiah? <laughs> the New Testament writers sure thought so. They, say, they wrote it 514 times in the New Testament. He was anointed, I go on to quote, to his great redemptive work as, pro as prophet, priest, and king of his people. This name, Christ, titled Christ, denotes that Jesus was divinely appointed and commissioned as the Savior, end quote. Let me ask you, is all your hope for now and eternity bound up in the person of Messiah, Christ, Jesus? Have you trusted in Him? It doesn't matter if you're Jewish background, Gentile background, have you trusted in Christ? Write this in your notes. Jesus is also identified as the fulfiller of prophecy. The fulfiller of prophecy. Look down at verse 2 in the first part of 3 and he says, which, the gospel of God, verse 1, which he promised beforehand, oh he did, uh huh, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, which gospel? Verse 3, concerning his son. <laughs> you see the connection there? The prophecies in the Old Testament about the gospel to come, it was promised beforehand. Concerning his son. Jesus is identified as the fulfiller of prophecy. I love Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. And in the New King James it says, I fell at his feet to worship him, this angel. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Listen. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, you want to understand the Old Testament prophecies and new, everything that is pointing forward to something, it's all about Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He's the identity, he's the fulfiller of prophecy, Paul writes here in chapter 1 of Romans. Jesus is also, write this down, identified as the seed of David. There in verse 3, concerning his son who was descended from David. He's the seed of David, the offspring, the seed of David that was promised. For Paul to use the phrase seed of David or descended from David, 
Same thing was to connect Jesus, listen, with the most important king of Old Testament Jewish history. Jesus, the seed of David. King David, if you'll recall, had it in his heart to build the Lord a house, a temple for his dwelling. But the Lord responded by telling David that God would build David a house. You want to build me a house? No, I'm not going to let you. Your son will. Um, but I'll build you a house. And the Lord told him in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. It was part of the Davidic covenant, that this promise that, that God was going to make sure there was a descendant on the throne of David forever. And so the Jewish people, listen, of Jesus' day, living about a thousand years after King David, they had seen a lot of Jewish history... And so how, oh, and by the way, kings had come and gone, right? After David, including his son Solomon, these kings had come, they had gone. The, the uh, kingdom had split, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Got a lot of history. They had gone into exile, they had come back. A remnant had come back from exile. So what was to come of this ancient 1,000-year-old promise God made to King David that there will always be a seed, always be a descendant on your throne forever? How would that ever be fulfilled? I mean, we've trashed our chance with God, but we're trying to be faithful now, first century Jew. And yet, how's this promise going to be fulfilled? The kingdom of the Jewish people in first century wasn't much to speak of. Wasn't that impressive at that time. I mean, after all, they were uh, a vassal state to Rome. I mean, they were under the domination of Rome. Paul reminds the Jewish background believers in Jesus, living in Rome, that the Lord they followed in faith is none other than the fulfillment of the ancient promise to David. Jesus is the seed of David. He's the one that God had in mind when he promised to David, there will always be somebody sitting on your throne, David. The seed of David is Jesus. He's the legacy of David. The throne of David will be occupied again. He's still coming. Only this time by the God-man, the seed of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of Christ's identities. The fulfiller of promises of the old uh, uh, predictions of the old prophecies of the old and the seed of David but also Jesus is identified in verse 4 write this down as the son of God verse 4 says it and he's declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord Jesus is identified as the son of God the Roman Caesar and these guys certainly developed out a God complex they like to be called Lord. It wasn't too much later on that uh, in, 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 in first century that they had to burn incense to Caesar as Lord. That was what the uh, state required people to do. And the early Christians wouldn't. But he liked to th the Caesar liked to think of himself as a Lord to be revered. Some felt like they were on par with the gods themselves. And certainly Nero ended up losing his brain, losing his mind. And others did as well. But Jesus, there's something different about him. Paul writes to these uh, Roman believers living at the seat of the, uh, of the world, superpower of the day, with a Caesar who thinks he's a Lord, and, and, and on par with the gods, the pantheon of gods. And, and he says, no, 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 you understand something. Jesus is the Son of God. This is something that would have spoken to the Gentile believers in Christ. We're told that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. What other spiritual leader in history can claim to have raised from the dead? There have been many who have been revered over the millennia. And we, we look at them in, history, in the history books and they thought of themselves, a lot of them as, as something great and certainly their followers uh, thought of them as something magnificent and they uh, started religions in people's names, right? But what other religious leader, what other spiritual leader, what other rabbi, what other person that says they're the Savior or Messiah can have this said about them? That they are declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness through the resurrection of the dead. 
In other words, you'll meet Jesus someday. The God-man glorified. You will meet him someday. And you will give an account of your life to him. And if you are in Christ, you need not fear. You need not tremble. Because all your sin is taken away. Cast away. It will never be brought. The charge of your sin will never be brought up against you. I heard preachers growing up saying there's going to be a movie screen and all your sins and everything's going to be there you know, on Judgment Day. Bull. It's not going to happen. Because all your sin, the guilt thereof, and everything, it's all taken away in Christ at the cross. He paid for it all to, to be remembered against you. That's a legal term in court. To be remembered against you no more. Done! That's awesome. You're going to meet this resurrected Christ someday. But those of you who have not trusted in Jesus alone for salvation, maybe you've been a, a good person, maybe you've been trying hard to maybe honor God, maybe you've been cleaning up your life, you've been working hard to make God know that you're serious about being a decent person. Here's the thing, it's not by your works of righteousness that you're saved, but it's according to His mercy. And you will meet Christ someday, but you will be under His judgment, you will be under His wrath. You will be on the receiving end of the, of the one who is glorified who's in, in, in Revelation where it has a sword coming out of his mouth to destroy the nations, to destroy the wicked. And you will be there trembling as you bow before him and confess that he is Lord and it will be eternally too late unless you trust in Christ now. And you turn from your sin now and you give your life to him in faith. And Jesus, you died on the cross. You paid for all my sin and I give my life to you. Jesus, you are Lord, your master. You make that exchange and you're forgiven. Your fear is gone. But you will meet this resurrected son of God someday. He is alive. Have you entrusted yourself to Jesus? Jesus, in verse 4, is also identified as the Lord and Master. Go back to verse 4. It says, by His resurrection from the dead. And then he ends with, Jesus Christ. Verse 4, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is identified as the Lord, our Lord and Master. The Roman Emperor may have wanted to have the title Lord. And he did. <laughs> the Lord Caesar, right? But no, there is only one who truly deserved it. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The emperor is dead and gone. And in hell, I might add. Jesus is alive and well. And have you bowed before him? Someday you will. We're looking at three identities in the introduction to Romans. We're learning about our own true identity as we go through this. We've looked at the identity of Paul and Jesus. Let's look lastly, write this down, at the identity of believers. The identity... Of believers. And continue to write in your notes believers are identified as those who are called to belong. Verse 6, he says, including you who are called to belong to whom? To whom? To Jesus Christ, right? Now listen, you were once far from God. You were, you were once on the outside of the family of God looking in, looking in the window. You were like the one everybody avoided at the high school dance. You were like the one with the bad breath that everybody kind of turns the other way. Or the coffee breath, which I have all the time. You were the outcast. You were the forsaken one. And you sensed there was something wrong. <laughs> You couldn't quite put your finger on it. You kept trying to fix it. But you were on the outside looking in. You were once far from God, the stranger, the sinner who belonged in the grip of the devil. You were in the grip of the evil one to do his will. You were powerless to change. And you certainly belonged far, far away from God because of your sin. But now you have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. Hey, and put your name there. Come close. You're called to belong now. You belong to Jesus Christ. You've been brought into 
the family. And now you look out through the window pane and see the outsiders out there who need to also be brought in. But you've been brought in, called to belong to Jesus Christ. You've been given a first class ticket to ride the gospel train to glory forever because of the mercy and kindness of the Father through Christ. Your destiny is heaven because you belong to the Lord of eternity, the darling of heaven, as Hillsong likes to say in one of their songs, Jesus Christ. Believers also, write this down, are identified as those who are loved by God. Loved by God. Imagine, the, imagine it here in verse number 7 where he says, To all those who are in Rome who are loved by God. Do you see that? Loved by God. Believers are identified as those who are loved by God. Imagine it. The God of the universe, the one who created all things, the one against whom you have rebelled, you have offended, against whom you have sinned, and he loves you anyway, despite your rebellion and sin. He loves you. I love what the Phillips New Testament uh, their version of this, 1 John 3, 1, where it says, Consider the incredible love that the Father has shown us in allowing us to be called children of God. And that is not just what we are called, but what we are. You're a child, if you're in Christ, you're a child of God. You are loved by God. That is amazing. Because I know the wicked sinner I've been in my life. And to think of God not as a judge ready to knock me over the head, but as one who's brought me really close because he's already judged Jesus for my sin. That, that is an amazing story I'll give my life to and have. So don't base your faith in God's love on your poor performance spiritually. You may do poorly any given day, any given moment. You go, oh, God must be really ticked off and whatever. What did I do to deserve this? Well, I must have done something really bad. Well, stop thinking that way. Base your faith in God's love on God's demonstration of love in Jesus at the cross. Again, using Philip's New Testament, the proof of God's amazing love is this, that it was while we were sinners that Christ died for us. God already knew the scoundrel you were going to be. <laughs> God already knew the sins that you were going to commit. Do you think that one word you've spoken or one thought you've thought, one deed you've done, you think any one of those things took God by surprise? Or do you think he took that in measure in his mind before he ever created you and before you ever took your first breath and he already dealt with your sin at the cross? So look to Jesus. And in verse 7, we also see, write this down, believers are identified as those who are called to be saints. Do you see that? Who are loved by God and called to be saints. You may have been called a loser. You may have been called a sinner. You may have been called a failure, an abuser, a drunk, a drug addict, an unfaithful spouse, a liar, a cheat, a disappointment, a mistake, a pain in the neck. But God calls you a saint. One who is set apart by God, consecrated as holy unto him, for God's purpose, God's use, for God's glory. A little bit of inspiration from that, from uh, another source. That was a powerful thought. Listen, your position has changed. Your standing before God is transformed. You are forever a saint of God in Christ Jesus. You might not think of yourself as a saint, but if you trust in Christ alone to save you, you are. It's Rocco the Saint. Let's just say it all together, Saint Rocco. Saint Rocco. Uh, sorry, Rock. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. You know, things are new in Jesus. You're no longer defined and labeled by what you once were. You are Hagios, holy, called to be a saint. And, and by the way, it's a state of being in Jesus, not just a wish. It's not like God looks at you and says, watch this, I'm going to call him a saint. <laughs> That's not what God's doing. He actually makes you positionally before God a saint. He sets you apart as a saint of God, a holy one of God. And just as God the Father is holy and Jesus the Son is holy, even so you who have trusted in Christ are holy. That is your position in Christ. It's a charis gift from the Lord, a grace gift from the Lord. Write this in your notes. Believers are identified as those who are blessed by the Father and the Son. 
who are blessed by the Father and the Son. Look what he says. It was a common well wish from Christian to Christian in the first century, and probably ought to be now, but look what he says. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed by the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So believers are blessed with grace from the God the Father. They're blessed with grace from the Son, the Lord Jesus. This word grace, charis in the Greek, God's kindness. Uh, one writer puts it, his good will toward us, his blessing, undeserved favor poured out in our lives. It's the grace from the Father and the Son. You haven't deserved it, but God has loved you anyway. You didn't earn it, but he has nothing and blessings in store for you for all of eternity. You haven't got a thing in your hands to offer him. Could you imagine going up to God and saying, hey, look at all the good stuff I've got to give you. And yet your hands are filled with filth. It doesn't look all that attractive to God. But I'll tell you what's attractive is His Son, the Lord Jesus, and God gave His very best for you in Jesus. You have grace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this morning, have you received by faith alone the salvation that God offers you in His Son, the crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, glorified, soon returning Jesus Christ? But He also mentions, lastly, believers are at peace, given peace, blessed with peace, arene, a peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. One source talking about this word in the Greek, it says it's basically the Old Testament word for, for peace, shalom, meaning completeness, soundness, well-being. And so he, he mentions you know, the blessings that he wishes for the Romans, grace to you and peace, wholeness, completeness, shalom. And how do you get that perfect peace from God? Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Where do you get that? Shalom, shalom, that perfect peace. Where do you get that? Well, it's through the, from the Father, and it's from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, I leave you my peace, my peace I give you. In Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We have peace. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And as they do, let me ask you a question. What is your identity? What is your identity? Is your identity wrapped up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you a slave to Christ, a saint of God? Have you trusted in Jesus to save you? Trust in Jesus today. In just a moment, we're going to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to sing. And if you need to respond, I invite you to come. I'll talk to you, pray with you. Or you can pray, pray right where you're at. Or maybe you want to connect with me later this week or Pastor Ryan. Our connect uh, information is in the bulletin. Reach out. We'd love to talk to you and show you how you can come closer to Christ. Father.